everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. As mentioned previously, my name is Christine Spang. And I'm here to talk to you folks about how meeting invites work and how they're a really cool example of a protocol that's actually built on top of email as the transport. Um, and I'm really excited about email, or not about email. Well, I am really excited about email, but I'm really excited about meeting invites in particular because um, by being built on top of uh, email as the transport. Hmm. I think her screensaver. Yeah, I was just screensaver. There we go. I should just change the slide more often from now on. Uh, so I was saying, um, by being built on top of email, uh, the meeting invites uh, protocol is able to be interoperable across multiple different calendar applications. So you don't need to know what calendar application uh, your friend is using in order to invite them to your party. All you need to know is their email address. And then you can send them an invite, and they can add your event to your calendar and RSVP back to you uh, without having to know what calendar applications are being used behind the scenes um, or anything beyond just the email address of the person that you're trying to get together with. So I think this is really neat. And I also think that there's a lot of possibilities for other things that could be built in a very similar manner. Um, because by using email in this way, we basically have like a distributed protocol for free that everyone has an account on, which to me is really, really exciting. All right, so the outline for this talk. So I'm going to start by showing you guys a quick example of the meeting invites protocol in action. So like sending out an invite and uh, kind of like seeing how RSVPs work. And after that, we're going to dive a bit into the actual technical details of what's happening behind the scenes to enable that. And we'll talk about uh, the specific components that make up this distributed protocol. Um, one is the iCalendar object model, which is a file format that's used for specifying calendar events. Uh, and the other two parts are these funny little things that I will describe in much more detail in this section. Um, one is the iCalendar transport independent interoperability protocol. That's a mouthful. Uh, it's shortened to iTIP. Uh, and then there's also the iCalendar message-based interoperability protocol, which is iMIP, which is uh, the first protocol adapted for email. Um, and I'll talk about that more in this section. After that, I'll talk a bit about what other things we could possibly build on top of email. And then I'll just give you guys a quick summary so you don't forget everything I said. All right, so let's get started. Let's first go through an example of how meeting invites work. All right, I don't, can you guys see this OK? Not terribly, not the words. Yeah, it's not important. You'll, you'll get the gist. So because live demos are treacherous, I have prepared a screencast that I will uh, narrate as I'm playing the video. Um, gosh, this table is like a little bit low. Uh, I think I'll just like, I'll crouch for now. All right. It's only a couple minutes. All right, so I use my personal calendar on Google Calendar, uh, like I'm sure a lot of you folks do. And uh, this weekend, I really want to invite my friend Ben Bitdiddle to the San Francisco Pride Parade. So I'm going to create a calendar event and uh, invite him. So you can just create a calendar event with the Google Calendar UI. And then I can go to the attendees and invite my friend Ben Bitdiddle. And then when I click Save in the Google Calendar UI, it will ask me if I want to send out the invitations. Um, and usually, I do want to send out the invitations. The only reason it prompts me not to send out the invitations um, is if, like, for example, all of my like, company was using Google Calendar, and we were just like, making meetings, and we don't need to like, notify anyone that you know, I'm inviting you to like, do something. So what actually happened there? So my friend Ben, um, he 
actually like is really concerned about privacy and he runs his own like IMAP server actually like in his basement and um, he doesn't like have any you know particular calendaring facilities with this um, this email server that he has it's just running you know it's running an open source IMAP server like Dovecot or Cyrus and he connects to that email account using uh, Mozilla Thunderbird so he can't just receive uh, an, uh, an invitation from Google Calendar uh, in a specific like custom way because Google Calendar doesn't know like what what my friend Ben is using to actually host his calendar. So luckily, email is a specification; it's a standard, and it's uh, very well established how to send someone an email. So my friend Ben can still receive calendar invites from me even though he's using a local calendar that's like running on his own desktop machine, those calendar events never like go to any server anywhere um, other than like coming from his email. So I'm showing you Ben's calendar here. And if we show Ben's email, you can actually see that he received an invitation email from me. And nothing was like added to his calendar automatically. But if you like go, he goes and clicks on uh, that email invitation. And so this is like Sunbird, the like Mozilla, like Thunderbird calendar extension. Um, and what this extension does is it extends Thunderbird in, and uh, gives some extra functionality to Thunderbird to integrate your email with your calendar. So you can see right here that uh, it says, oh, I found a calendar event in this email message. Um, and it gives, gives some buttons like accept, tentative, or decline. And so that's so like Ben can tell me like whether or not he's actually going to come to the parade with me. So Ben wants to come hang out, so he's going to say yes. And he clicks the button to send me the message that says yes, I'm coming. And then Sunbird actually just like adds that calendar event automatically to his calendar because he said he was going, so he probably wants to remember it. And if we like click on the calendar event, you can see that uh, the calendar uh, Sunbird knows that both of us have said we're going to go, and there's like some extra details about like the time and stuff like that. All right, so what happened when Ben actually clicked accept in Sunbird? So if I go to my email, I can see that uh, I have an email from Ben and a couple other emails because I was testing this a few times. Yeah. And it says that Ben has like, accepted my invitation. And you can see that in Google Calendar, it actually does, like, doesn't prompt you to like do anything in that case. And if I switch on over to my calendar, uh, I can see that Google Calendar has actually automatically updated the participant status to say that Ben said yes, he's coming to the parade. So like, one thing that's interesting here is that you know, we have these two different calendar applications they managed to talk to each other over email, and they're able to actually implement like how they deal with that protocol and how they update the calendar in different ways. So in Sunbird, uh, you have to like click on a button and say yes, add it to my calendar. Yes, I'm going. Whereas in Google Calendar, it will automatically scrape message or me scrape, scrape events from your email, and it'll add those to your calendar. And there's like some settings you can set to like turn it off if like you're getting spammed with calendar events or whatever. And it works the same way uh, in the reverse. So Ben can also send me an invite. So he wants to hang out and like go have a picnic after the parade. So he can make a calendar event in Sunbird as well and invite me.
And you see, it automatically pops up on my calendar. And I can RSVP yes. And then back in Ben's email, he got an RSVP message. And that's pretty much it in the video. Uh, it turns out that like it's a little confusing with the organizer UI in Sunbird to show like the participant status, like when you actually sent out the invite. But both of us have said yes, we're going. Um, so it works in both ways. Like there's this one proprietary system that's implementing this protocol, uh, and there's this other free software system, and they can both talk to each other. And my email and Ben's email uh, are on to living on totally different systems. I just have Ben's email address and he has my email address. And yet we're able to use applications that uh, interoperate and talk to each other so that we can actually like do things together and um, you know, like I'm an introvert, I like still like to do things with other people. Like uh, it's nice to be able to talk to other people and um, using a protocol that's built on top of email allows us to do this in a way that uh, means that you don't have to have both accounts on the same system. So when I first figured out that this is how calendar invites work, my like mind was blown. It's like super cool to have this like client side protocol that uses um, email as a transport. So now I want to dive a bit more into the actual technical details. So I showed you guys like a high level overview of these two systems uh, that are very different, built on top of like different infrastructure, uh, interoperating and talking to each other so that uh, a client application um, can do things that involve other people. Um, but there are protocols that these systems are built on top of uh, in order to actually make it work. And I want to share with you folks some details about how these actually work. So, the first piece of the puzzle is this amazing format called the iCalendar object model. And if you're really curious about the iCalendar object model, you can go ahead and read RFC 5545. Uh, it's uh, very uh, enlightening about exactly how this works. But I'll give you folks some like high level uh, understanding of this particular protocol. So you can see that uh, it's littered with like, uh, like these begin and then like end statements, so it's like begin v calendar, uh, begin daylight, uh, end daylight, begin standard. Um, and a lot of these sections actually like start with v. So the iCalendar protocol is actually descended from uh, a different format called v calendar, which was created by Microsoft for use in Microsoft Outlook. Um, so switch the IO for the v, but kept the format in its core the same so that they can be compatible and like you can import v calendar events into a system that understands i calendar, but not generally the other way around. Um, so i calendar objects consist of components. So they start out with this root component, which is called v calendar, which uh, defines like this is a calendar. So like an i calendar object model file could contain one event or it could contain multiple events. You can use this file format to actually export your entire calendar. Uh, that could contain you know, thousands of events. Um, and uh, there are ways to specify the time zone. So there's this component called v time zone. And then in that, you can specify like, uh, how like, daylight savings time works, like how standard time works. Uh, time zones are like, really complex and complicated. I'm not going to talk too much about time zones. But it provides you all of the ways to like, actually specify you know, how the time zone works for this calendar. Um, and even like the time scale, so you can say like my calendar is in Gregorian time. <laughs> um, because some calendars aren't. And then you can have events, and you can have reminders, and there's a couple other possible sections. Um, you can actually also use the iCalendar object model to send to-do list items. So actually, I haven't seen like an application that like like implements distributed to-do lists, but that would be kind of awesome. Someone should build it because it's all there in the spec. Uh, there are tools to like make files that 
you could send to other people that contain to-do list items. I don't know why no one's done it yet. And so once we have this like base object model specification, uh, that doesn't really help us do like actual meeting invitations because you need to have uh, like a protocol on top of that in order to specify like how do I like ask my friend uh, to come to this event and how does he uh, send a message back to me that says um, yeah I'm going to come or no I'm not coming how do I like update uh, my friend that I like canceled the event if like something changed or like change the time or like you know add the location afterwards. Um, so this is where the iCalendar Transport Independent Interoperability Protocol, or RFC 5546, uh, comes into play. And so this, this specification, uh, the iCalendar authors were like, I, I guess they like really wanted to define a protocol that could like be sent over different mechanisms. So they first define this base specification, that's like the transport independent version, which uh, defines these verbs, these commands, uh, which are not tied to any particular way of transmitting. It's just like I have a message, and uh, you know it contains an iCalendar file with probably an event in it, or um, and then like on that event I have a verb that's like, am I requesting a new event? Uh, am I replying to a request? Am I canceling? Uh, am I like, updating it? Um, so. This could be sent over like any any transport you want. You could send it over HTTP or uh, email or like uh, just like raw packets or whatever. Uh, any way of transporting data to another source, you could implement this protocol over. Um, but in practice, people don't actually like do things over uh, other transports. Mostly, they're sent over email. So the RFC that came after that one, which I think the latest version is RFC 6047, um, is uh, the adaptation of this transport independent protocol to email. So it defines like how you can send these messages over email. And the way it works is you basically send a message which has a content type and you say it's text slash calendar. And I don't want to speak too much about MIME, but if you don't know, MIME is uh, a way of encoding email messages that uh, it's the way that allows you to uh, send attachments. So it, you can define like what kind of data you're sending and bundle it all together uh, into an encoding and send it over the wire over SMTP. So if you send a message that contains uh, a MIME part of the text calendar type and uh, you send it with a parameter that says which method from the previous slide uh, you're actually using. Clients can interpret that and uh, know that this is a calendar event and that they should do something different with it. So every client has to like read the email and see this specific formatting and decide what to do with it. So in Google Calendar's case, it just like sees it and puts it on your calendar. And in Sunbird, it's like, well, OK, I found an event. Do you want to put it on your calendar? Are you going? And if you say you're going, uh, it will put it on your calendar for you. So each client has its own like leeway to impl implement this in whatever way uh, they want. And do you have a question? Uh, so like, if you send an email with the delete to going with Gmail, it just like, kill their I don't know exactly what they do in that case. Um, it might not remove events from your calendar automatically. I suspect it doesn't, and that like the person actually has to like delete it. Um, there are like lots of cool things you could do, combined with like message authentication to like allow people to like modify things more and be less conservative about what you're um, accepting from other sources. But that kind of gets into like email authentication, um, which is relevant, but perhaps we should talk about more at the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> cool, so actually at this point, I want to show you guys some code. Um, 
So for this uh, talk, I wrote up a little script that actually will format a basic message that contains a calendar invite and sends it out. And just to like illustrate that, you know, there's nothing like super magic-y going on here. Like any any code can implement this. Uh, all you have to do is like format a message in the right way. So I'm gonna walk. I guess I can walk a, like a little bit through this code. So I'm using Python here, and there you go. Oh, okay. There you go. And that's in the standard library. No, you have okay. to get that off PyPI. Okay. So there's a iCalendar module on PyPI that implements the iCalendar object model file format, awesome. which you can download and use it to create calendar events. And just to be real quick, is this the same kind of thing that is often a .ics attachment? Yes. So a little bit more about the actual files that are, or the actual messages that are sent. Uh, actually, you I know, can. If you just want to go through it. It's fine. Yeah, well, um, I'm just trying to think of whether whether it would be make more sense to look at one thing first and then go through this, or or not. Um, yeah, let's take one quick break to look at something. Uh, uh, not that one. Uh, I think. Oh, I think it's this one. Yeah. So you can see in this file that it actually contains the ICS file twice, once here <laughs> and once there. And I saw this and on the header, it says playing dot, dot ICS, right? Yeah, so one of these is included as an attachment with the application slash ICS content type. And the reason for this is because all of the logic for this protocol is in clients, some clients have uh, like decided to implement how they interpret messages that are formatted to contain calendar events in, in different ways. So in order to make sure that it's recognized as a calendar event as in as many places as possible, many clients will encode the calendar event in multiple ways and include it in the same file. So I don't know exactly which client it is that wants it as an attachment, but some client somewhere wants an attachment with the event file and won't accept the just text slash calendar mime part. So in order to be compatible, People just send both. Thank you. That's yeah. Really... Yeah. Bonus points if you can figure out which client it is, because I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Actually, yeah, I was here. So you can use this Python module to create an iCalendar file, and in each of the components of the file, there are a bunch of properties which actually define the individual parts of the component. So like on like a daylight savings time, gives me some like offsets for the time zone, gives you like the name of the time zone, this is in Pacific time. And then there's this awesome thing called the R rule, which is a little bit out of the scope of this talk and I will not dive into in too much detail. But this is like the way that you define recurring events and could be deserving of its own talk. And here's like the event. So an important part of the iCalendar protocol is that every event has a UID. And that's how your calendar locally can be smart about dealing with updates. So I change like the description of my calendar event. I want to send out an update to everyone who's participating in that event. I maintain the UID of that event, and then all of the uh, consuming clients can know that this is referring to an old event and not create duplicate events. And then there's the organizer and attendees, which have very different functions. 
So the organizer is the only one who can make changes to the actual event or cancel it. Uh, attendees can often like invite other attendees, but can't actually change the base event. And then the thing about transparency is what your calendar interprets as like whether you're like free or busy. So often calendars will have uh, a way to like have an event on your calendar, but say you're not busy during it. Uh, and then there's actually a way in the iCalendar object model specification to send a request to figure out when someone's free for the purposes of scheduling, which is another neat feature. Wow. And so once you have uh, an iCalendar string, you have to format an email message. And I'm using this library called Flinker, which was created by the folks at Mailgun, which is uh, like a transactional mail service. And my company actually uses their library as well and contributes upstream to it for uh, our email API. And so you can just format a very simple message. And then this block of code here is just sending it actually from my email account using the Nihilus email API, which is just, it's simpler than like using local SMTP <laughs> and like much more like reliable for like spam reasons and stuff. Um, so that's like actually all you need for like the base of sending out a meeting request. And I can actually extend this right now uh, whoops. And unfortunately, because of how clients can implement things differently, it can actually be like a little bit difficult to figure out like what will actually be recognized as a calendar event by different clients. So like this is actually like not being recognized correctly right now, which is funny. I, I must have something wrong. Actually, there's like another engineer on my team who's been implementing like a RSVP functionality for us and like has figured all this stuff out, but I need to talk to him about what was actually wrong. But eventually I'll fix the script and it will work. And in theory, this is like all you need. And you could also like RSVP with the same kind of thing. Uh, it's just like a very small bit of code to, to format the right uh, iCalendar file, and then you send it out to your friend, and uh, their calendar can update. Uh, I keep getting confused because my slides are in HTML. Okay, so that's the basics of how iCalendar and I tip and I mip work together in order to allow me, running on Google Calendar, to invite my friend Ben, ben Bittiddle, running his own IMAP server uh, in his basement, to the same event. And we can show up at the same, same place and the same time and have a good time. Um, but calendar events are not like the only thing that I think could be built on top of email this way. And as I mentioned before, there are a lot of really cool properties of, of this system. And while like, there's a lot of things that make it a little tricky to actually like, implement clients in that whenever you put like, all of the power in the client, there's always like, the opportunity to like, be incompatible. Um, but there's also a lot of good things like you only need to have your friend's email address in order to be able to like do some sort of like distributed application with them. Um, and everyone already has an email account. Like you don't need to sign up for Facebook. You don't need to um, like get them to sign up for like your news service. You don't have to have everything living on the same one centralized server. Um, so by having all this power in the client, you actually have like a lot more flexibility for um, what you can actually build. So I think a couple ideas for things you could build. Um, like one little example is you could build like 
a personal finance app that like pulls all the receipts out of your email, and uh, you know whenever you buy something somewhere, somewhere that person you know sends you a receipt. You could have just like Venmo on top of your email. You could also use email to bootstrap video calls. So you could you know send out a request to someone that contains like some encoded file format that's machine readable that tells the person how to connect to me and like start a video call. You wouldn't like send like all the video data over email, that would be crazy. Uh, it's really not made for that. <laughs> but because email solves like the routing problem and the account like identity problem and there's all this like global distributed infrastructure all over the world that you know deals with like spam and like security and like uh, sending your message to the other person. You have this like cool base that you can build things on top of. You can also build a social network. So I could instead of you know logging into Facebook for uh, posting updates, I could you know have some sort of like friend network that sends updates over email and then people have like a local running client that will aggregate those and display them and you could share pictures and all of the all the same things. Um, I think that's all the ideas. Maybe we should talk after about other possible ideas that maybe you have. Okay, I want to wrap up. <laughs> We're not quite done yet. Uh, so the two big things that I talked about in this talk are one, email or meeting invites are not magic. They're just iCalendar that's sent over email. I know that I used to think that like it was just, I, I don't even know, it was talking to some server or like who even knows, but it's just an email message that sends out over email and the client interprets it. Using email as a transport enables interoperability between systems. So Google Calendar can talk to uh, Sunbird running on your local machine, can talk to like Outlook running on someone else's computer. And because it's using email to send the data, you don't have to worry about you know, where that account lives or what, what application is consuming it. And we could build other stuff in the same way. I wanted to share with you folks some additional reading, if you're curious, for uh, a lot of nitty gritty details. For internet protocols, always the canonical uh, go-to place to figure out how to like implement them is the RFCs. So if you happen to be like trying to you know, write iCalendar files or like a, like a generator or just like really want to know that all the details about the specification, you can reference the RFCs. And then I included a couple links to some interesting systems that use email in similar ways to, that, to what I was talking about on the previous slide. Um, there's this one paper that was published by some people at Stanford uh, about a distributed social network called Mr. Privacy. Um, great name. And uh, there's this guy, Mark Pessy, who um, played around with this like thing he called Plexus for a while, which is like, I, I don't have like a really good summary of what it does, but it uses email to like exchange metadata and does like social stuff. Um, this is like a link to GitHub, actually. And that's all I got. <laughs>